Let us pray. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, Son of the living God, God most high, who has created me and formed my soul after your own divine image and likeness, and had made me capable of everlasting happiness. Grant that I may serve you, my Lord, my God and my Father, with a faithful heart, that I may fight against my sins with a holy hatred, and that all sinful passion and affection being destroyed within me, I may be renewed in perfect innocence of life. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who has given me for my use the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, and has granted them for my service and comfort. Permit, I beseech you, O Lord, that I may never abuse your creatures, but that all the works of your hands may tell of your goodness, and may lead me to admire, to know, and to love you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, out of your affection for me, granted me to be born in the true Christian faith, and has mercifully brought me up from the beginning of my life, supplying me with food and the other necessaries for the nourishment and support of my body. May my heart find no relish except in and through you. May you alone possess my innermost soul. May I exceedingly hunger for you, the bread of heaven, and thirst for you, the fountain of life, so that this life's exile ended, I may deserve to be satisfied with the joys of your eternal perfection. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who up until this time has preserved and delivered me from countless dangers of soul and body, even when I abused your gifts not deserting me. Illuminate my heart, I beseech you, with the brightness of your grace, that truly perceiving your goodness to me and my own ingratitude toward you, I may bemoan myself, I may be hateful in my own sight, but I may please you, my Creator and my only Redeemer, in all things. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I lie immersed in the most loathsome vices and was leading a most ungodly life, in your long-suffering bore with me for such a long time and brought me to repentance. Grant that my acceptable contrition and holy works I may expiate the stains of my past sin and that from now on I may lead a life of purity and love you above all things with most burning love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I was on the brink of the very precipice and just within the jaws of hell, did not permit me to perish, but called me, though deaf, and trying to run from you to the way of salvation. Grant that from now on I may follow after you with humble devotion, and with a joyful heart correspond to your holy inspirations. With from my heart farewell to all things, and may cleave inseparably to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who always directed me, the vilest of sinners, has protected me, has looked upon me with the eyes of mercy, and still so fondly supports and cherishes me with your goodness, despite my daily transgressions, as if forgetful of all others. You cared for me alone. Grant that I also may love you most ardently, leaving all transitory things for your sake, and may think of you alone, and may with a ready mind and in all places follow and perform your holy will. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the time of King Herod, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the one who is born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was alarmed and all of Jerusalem with him. After assembling all the chief priests and experts in the law, he asked them where the Christ was due to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for it is written this way by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are in no way least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod privately summoned the wise men, and determined from them when the star had appeared. He sent them to Jerusalem and said, Go, look carefully for the child. When you find him, inform me that I also may go and worship him. After listening to the king, they left, and once again the star they had seen when it rose led them until it stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they shouted with joy. And as they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure boxes and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. But after being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back by another route to their own country. After they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to look for the child to kill him. Then he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and went to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. And in this way, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet was fulfilled. I called my son out of Egypt. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was enraged, and he sent men to kill all the children in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding region from the age of two and under, according to the time he had learnt from the wise men. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud wailing, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted, because they were gone. After Herod had died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Get up, and take the child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother, and returned to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Achelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he went to the region of Galilee. He came to a town called Nazareth and settled there. Then what had been spoken by the prophets was fulfilled, that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This one chapter contains all that the St. Matthew records of the childhood of Christ. St. Mark and St. John tell us nothing, and St. Luke very little. This singular reticence has often been remarked upon that it is certainly most noteworthy, and is only a sign of its genuine and truthfulness. A token that what these men wrote was in the deepest sense not their own. 
for if they had been left to themselves in the performance of the task given to them, they surely would not have restrained themselves as they had done. The Jews of the time attached great importance to child life, as is evident from the single fact that they had no less than seven different words to mark the successive ages of development from the newborn to the young man, and to omit all reference to these stages, except the slight notice of the infancy in this chapter, was certainly not, according to Matthew the Jew, not what would have been expected of him had he been left to his own devices. The only explanation we can have is that he was moved or restrained by the Holy Spirit. This view is strikingly confirmed by comparison with the spurious Gospels afterwards published by men who thought they might improve upon the original records with their childish stories as to what the boy Jesus said and did. These awkward fictions reflect the spirit of the age, but the simple records of the four evangelists mirror for us the spirit of truth. To the vulgar mind they may seem bare and defective, but all men of culture and mature judgment recognise in their simplicity and naturalness a note of manifest superiority. Much space could indeed be occupied in discussing the advantages of this reticence, but a single illustration may suggest the main thought. Let us recall for one moment the well-known picture entitled The Shadow of the Cross, designed and executed by a master, who might surely be considered qualified to illustrating detail the life in Nazareth. We have nothing to say as to the merit of the picture as a work of art, let alone those specifically qualified to judge to speak of this. But it is not generally felt that the realism of the carpenter's shop is most painful. The eye is averted from the true obtrusive detail, while the mind gladly returns to the startling vividness of the picture of the vague impressions made on us by the hint in the scriptures. Was it not well that our blessed Saviour should grow in retirement and seclusion? And if so, why should that seclusion be invaded? If his family was withdrawn from the eyes of man at that time, there remains the same reason why it should be withdrawn from the eyes of man for all time. And the more we think of it, the more we realise that it is better in every way that the veil should have been dropped just where it has been, that all should remain just as it was, when with unconscious skill the sacred artists finished their perfect sketches of the child Jesus. However, let us turn the argument around and look at it from the opposite direction. If St Matthew would tell us so little, why should he say anything at all? What was his purpose in relating what he sets out in his second chapter? We believe it must have been to show how Christ was received. In fact, it seems to correspond to the single sentence in the fourth gospel. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Only St Matthew gives a slightly wider and brighter view. He shows us not only how Jerusalem rejected him, but how the East welcomed him, and Egypt sheltered him. Throughout the entire Old Testament, our attention is often called not merely to Jerusalem, which occupied the centre of the ancient world, but to the kingdoms around about, especially to the great empires of the East and the South. The Empire of the East represented in succession by Chaldea, Assyria, Babylonia, Media and Persia, and that of the South, the mighty monarchy of Egypt, which under its thirty dynasties 
held a steady course alongside these. How natural then for the evangelist, whose special mission it was to connect the old with the new, to take the opportunity to show that while his own Jerusalem rejected the Messiah, the old rivals of the east and the south welcomed him. In the first chapter, the child Jesus was set out as the heir of the promise made to Abraham and his seed, and the fulfilment of the prophecy given to the chosen people. Now he is further set forth as the one who satisfied the longing of those they had been taught to regard as their natural enemies, but now who should be looked upon as their fellow heirs with them of God's heritage, and sharers in his promise in Christ by the gospel. We can see then how the second chapter needed to complete the first, and how the two together give us a much more complete view of the Advent, as was most needed by the Jews of the period. And while it is instructive and suggestive to men of all countries and of all time. As then, the last paragraph began with, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was in this way. We may regard this as beginning with, now the reception of Christ was on this way. According to this plan of argument, we must disregard the detail and many interesting question, for the consideration of which is surely enough to refer many well-known and widely read books on the life of Christ. Let us instead confine ourselves to the general thoughts and suggestions which seem best fitted to bring out the spirit of today's passage as a whole. Let us then look first at the manner of his reception in Jerusalem, the city which, as the son of David, he could claim as his own. It was the very centre of the circle of Old Testament illumination. It had all possible advantages over any other place in the world for knowing when and how the Christ would come. And yet, when he did come, the people of Jerusalem knew nothing about it. They had their first intimation from strangers who had come from the far east to seek him. Not only did they know nothing about it until they were told, but when told, they were troubled. Indifference, where we would otherwise have expected excitement and eagerness, Trouble where we should have looked for joy. We have only to examine the contemporary records of the state of Jerusalem to understand it thoroughly and to see how exceedingly natural this reaction would have been. Those unacquainted with these records can have no idea of the gaiety and frivolity of the Jewish capital at that time. We all know, of course, something of the style and magnificence of which Herod the Great lived. But one is not apt to suppose that luxurious living was the rule amongst the people of the town, and yet it seems to have been so. How much there was to be seen and heard in these luxuriously furnished houses and the sumptuous entertainments. In the women's apartments we read from accounts contemporary, that friends from the country would see every novelty in dress, adornment and jewellery, and have the benefit of examining, them, examining themselves in mirrors. Female visitors could buy anything in Jerusalem, from a false tooth to an Arabian veil, a Persian shore, all an Indian dress. Then, after furnishing such painful evidence of Jerusalem and the moral corruption to which it led, we can conclude by looking at one of the sacred books at the time, which describes the dignity of the Jerusalemites, mentioning the wealth in which they lavished of their marriages, the ceremonies which insisted on repeated invitations to the guests for a banquet, 
that men inferior should not be bidden, the dress in which they appeared, the manner in which the dishes should be served, the wine in white crystal vases, the punishment of the cook who failed in his duty, and so on. From which we may place in context many of the gospel stories that we will go on to read. If things of this kind represented the dignity of the people of Jerusalem, we need not inquire further as to why they were troubled when they heard that to them had been born in Jerusalem a Saviour, who was Christ the Lord. A Saviour who would have saved them from their sins was the very last thing that people of that kind would have wanted. Herod suited them far better, for it was he and his court that set the example of the luxury and profligacy which characterised the capital. Do not all these revelations as to the state of things in the capital of Israel set off more vividly than ever the pure lustre of the quiet, simple, humble, peaceful surroundings of the babe of Bethlehem and the boy of Nazareth. Put the dignity and the trouble of Jerusalem over against the humility and peace of Bethlehem, and say which is the more dignified and desirable. When we look at the contrast, we cease to wonder that with the exception of a very few devout Simeons and Annas, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Jerusalem as a whole was deeply troubled to hear the rumour of the advent of her saviour king. Herod's trouble, we can so readily understand that we did not need to spend much more time over it, or over what he did to try and get rid of it, so thoroughly in keeping as it was with all that history tells us of his character and conduct. No wonder that his one thought on his mind was, dispose of him. But who were these truly dignified men, who are now turning their backs on rich and gay Jerusalem, and setting their faces to the obscurity and poverty of the village of Bethlehem? They were men of wealth and rank, and learning from the Far East, representative of all that is best in the old civilizations of the world. They had only the scantest opportunities of learning what was the hope of Israel, how it should be realised, but they were earnest men, and their minds were not taken up with gaiety and frivolity. They had studied the works of nature until their souls were full of the thoughts of God in his glory and majesty, but their hearts yearned for knowledge of it. Whose glory was in heavens, who could stoop to cure the ills that flesh is heir to. They had heard through of Israel's hope, the hope of a child to be born of David's race, who would bring divine mercy near to human need. They had a vague idea that the time for fulfilment of that hope was coming near. And as they mused, they behold a marvellous appearance in the heavens which called them away to seek him whom their souls desired. Hence their long journey to Jerusalem and their eager entrance into Bethlehem. Had their dignity been the kind of dignity which was boasted of in Jerusalem, they would no doubt have been offended by the poverty of the surroundings. The poor house with its scanty furniture and its humble occupiers. But theirs was a true dignity of mind and soul, and so they were not offended by their surroundings. They recognised in them the humble child as the object of their search, and bowed before him, paying homage, presenting to him gifts as a tribute from the East to the coming King of Righteousness and Love. And what a beautiful picture, how striking the contrast to the magnific magnificence of Herod the Great in Jerusalem, surrounding by his wealthy and luxurious court. Verily, these were wise men from the East, wise with a wisdom not of this world, 
wise to recognize the hope of the future, not in a monarch called the Great, surrounded by pomp and luxury, but in the fresh young life of a holy heaven-born child. Learned as they were, they had simple hearts. They had some glimpse of the great truth that it is not learning the world needs so much as life, new life. Would that all the wise men of today be equally wise in heart. We can rejoice that many of them are, but if only all of them had true wisdom, they would consider that even those who stand as high in the learning of the new West as the men did in the learning of the old East would do themselves an honour in bowing low in the presence of the Holy Child and acknowledge that by no effort of the greatest intellect is it possible to reach that truth which can alone meet the deepest want of man. That there is no other hope for man than the new birth, the fresh, pure, holy life which came into the world when Christ was born and which comes into every heart that in the simple tr trustfulness gives him a welcome, as did these wise men of old. There, at the threshold of the gospel, we see the true relation of science and religion. Let knowledge grow from more to more, but more of reverence in us dwell, that mind and soul, according well, may make one music as before. All honour to these wise men for bending low in the presence of the Holy Child. And thanks be to God for allowing his servant Matthew to give us a glimpse of a scene so beautiful, so touching, so suggestive of pure, high and holy thought and feeling. The gifts of the East no doubt provided the means of securing a refuge in the South and the West. That Egypt gave the fugitives a friendly welcome, a safe retreat so long as the danger remained, is obvious. But here again, we are left without detail. The one thing which the evangelist wishes to impress upon us is the parallel between the experience of Israel and Israel's Holy One. Israel of the Old Testament born in Palestine fled to Egypt. When the time was right for return, the way was opened for it, and the prophet speaks of it in the name of the Lord. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Now that the Holy One of Israel has come to fulfil old Israel's destiny, the prophetic word, which had only been partially realised in the history of the nation, is fulfilled in the history of the Anointed One. So, just as it had happened with the nation, so it happens with the nation's representative and true king. Born in his own land, he fled to Egypt, remaining there until God brought him out and set him in his land once more. Other points of agreement with the prophetic word are mentioned, and it is worthy of note that they are all connected with the dark side of the prophecy concerning the Messiah. But the reason for this will surely appear to us on reflection. The scribes and the Pharisees were insistent enough on the bright side, the side that favoured their ideas of a great king who had rescued the people from the Roman yoke and found a great worldwide kingdom after the manner of Herod the Great or of Caesar the Mighty. So there was no need to bring strongly out that side of the prophecy which foretold of the glories of the coming king. But the sad side had been entirely neglected. It is this, accordingly, which our evangelist today is prompted to illustrate. It was indeed in itself an occasion of stumbling that the king of Israel should have to flee to Egypt. But why should one stumble at it? who looked at the course of Israel's history as a nation, in the light the prophets threw upon it. It was an occasion of stumbling that his birth in Bethlehem should bring with it such sorrow and anguish. But why wonder at it when so great a prophet as Jeremiah so touchingly speaks of the voice heard in Ramah? 
Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted. A thought of exquisite beauty and pathos, as Jeremiah used it in reference to the banished ones of his day, but of still deeper pathos, as is fulfilled in the sorrow at Ramah over the massacre of her innocence, when not Israel, but Israel's Holy One, is banished from the land of his birth. Again, it was an occasion of stumbling that the king of Israel, instead of growing up in majesty in the midst of the court and the capital, should retire into obscurity in the little village of Nazareth, and for many years be unheard of by the great ones of the land. But why wonder at it, when the prophets again and again represent him as growing up in this very way, as a root out of the dry ground, or as a twig to shoot from the stem of Jesse, growing up out of his place and attracting no attention while he grew. Such is the meaning of the words translated, he shall be called a Nazarene. This does not appear in our language, hence the difficulty which many have found in this reference. There being no passage in any of the prophets where Christ is spoken of as a Nazarene. But the word in Hebrew is, at once suggests the Hebrew for branch, continually applied to him by the prophets, and especially connected with the idea of his quiet and silent growth, aloof from the throng and unnoticed by the great. And so, appropriately, this completes the sketch of his reception, unthought of by his own, until strangers sought him, a source of trouble to them when they heard of him, his life threatened by the occupant for the time of David's throne. He is saved only by exile, and on return to his people passes out of notice, and the great world moved on unconscious and unconcerned, while its saviour king prepares in the obscurity of his small village home for the great work of winning a lost world back to God.
Let us pray. O God, who has prepared for those who love you such good things as pass man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward you, that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.